I thought we might divide the discussion of the new 5A and 6A state percussion sheets into a couple of parts. We'll begin with the left side and the content box. The descriptors include things like coordination of all performing elements, suitability, frequency and demand of movement while playing, content with respect to challenge, continuity and flow. Um, tell us a little bit about how you as an adjudicator would assess the content side of a percussion program. Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me, Jerry. It's great to see you. I'd love to dive into all these elements. So I will say right off the top of the, of the hour here that all of these subjects could really be extrapolated into a huge discussion. So I'm going to try to stay as concise as possible. So when you talk about the content, so everyone tends to think of vocabulary first, right? That's not wrong. But one of the things that I, I think that is really important that we are always shining a light on is what content truly can mean at the real expense of the aesthetic of the band. Right, So I'm going to continue to come back to what we can do as percussion directors to really elevate the wind book through the performers. And as a judge, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for opportunities to reward all the students on the field. Of course, through the lens of the designer and the director, so on and so forth. So when you talk about all these six or seven different bullet points in their content, each of them are a whole world. A lot of them could really be thought of initially as, oh, that's simply, that's simply vocabulary. Well, that's just the, really the tip of the iceberg. So for instance, coordination of all performing elements. That right off the bat is simply anything that is percussive and how that really relates to the entire aesthetic of the show and the wind book. And so if you always look at the filter through which how is this enhancing the show through the percussive element, you will never go wrong ever. So a lot of times, all of us can be very myopic in terms of, oh, not enough flams, there's a lot of diddles, or the front ensemble's doing this, and four mouths, ooh, permutations. All that is good. All of that is very important. We're going to talk about those technical aspects, but the coordination of all performing elements could simply mean, what a beautiful way to use space. Did you notice that the bass drums did not come in in, t in the entire ballad? They used the upper battery as this color voice throughout all the woodwind passage, and they used a different implement. That was brilliant. I would have never thought of that. Well, that comes under the coordination of all performing elements, using space, using rests, using different implement changes and colors. So not just the coordination of what kind of musical vocabulary am I throwing down every 10 seconds of an eight minute show. Uh, moving on to the next bullet point, the suitability of musical content. I personally think that if you continue to come back to the word taste, what is going to enhance the composer or the arranger's intent? So if I'm playing Spark, I need to understand what the original source material was trying to pull and elicit from the listener. I hear this muted brass. I hear this color. Well, what is the percussion score going to do to actually jump off the page rather than, well, it's, it's spark and it's beautiful, but here I am at a marching band show, so I'm going to hear a snare drum tuned really high. That's not enough. We need to continue to ask ourselves, what can we do to elevate that in a different genre called marching band? Moving on to the next bullet point, the frequency and demand of movement while playing. So this is a really, really neat topic that is typically not articulated on a sheet. So kudos uh, to the, the folks there that put this on the sheet. So the frequency of movement would not just be the amount of steps you're taking while you're playing some challenging vocabulary, but also the type of movement, right? Mm -hmm. So now we have the indoor and the outdoor. All of those genres are really enhancing one another. So it's not just big step sizes or fast tempi that we're considering, but rather what am I doing from a responsibility standpoint to manipulate my upper body such that I have control of this soft roll while I'm doing this lower body responsibility. That is a whole world that we need to always keep at the tip of our brain because every band program is going to have a different level of comfort what they're gonna to introduce to their students. The next bullet point, content with respect to challenge. Now this is going to recapitulate the very first thing that I said. 
challenge. So as a percussionist, I like technique and chops and, and technical vocabulary as much as the next person. So the first thing that many of us are drawn to when they see the word challenge is, boy, that such and such band has a lot of fast rolls, or boy, the permutation, the front ensemble, or there's a, there's a quick 30 second note lick here at Flight of the Bumblebee. All those things are obviously challenging to the ear, but there are all kinds of other challenges that I think that a lot of us overlook. For instance, space. If you have something that is not quite as challenging to play once your hands are engaged, but you're waiting three quarter notes before you come in, as we all know, veteran band directors, we all know that teaching students to negotiate space is easily the hardest skill in developing that innate sense of maturity and space to wait and place a musical moment exactly where it's intended to be. To me, that's just as great of a challenge, and that's on top of all the technical vocabulary. Uh, the other types of challenges would, of course, be environmental. What are we doing in terms of our body movement, our frequency of body movement, our step size? Where are we on the field? Is the battery in front of the winds? And that's, mm -hmm. we actually saw a very, very high achieving marching band that went very, very high in the process the last go around that actually had two moments in their show and they did it beautifully. They did it from a balance and a touch perspective and put the winds behind them and the timing was excellent. Well, that takes a lot of coordination and again, recognizing that as a challenge is not just what the, the, the battery played, but rather everything that encompassed that vocabulary. The continuity and flow and pacing. This goes hand in hand with the overall flow of the entire show. So if I'm looking at the flow of the wind score and I have moment one to moment last, zero seconds to eight minutes, let's say. The flow and pacing in many ways is really, really subservient to what the winds are asking the percussion to do. Great, no problems there. But in a real way, we still have choices as far as our orchestration, our density of orchestration, and our dynamics along that journey. So a lot of times we have a wind score that starts here and has peaks and valleys and is beautifully crafted, but perhaps the, the percussion arranger didn't perhaps think about the last time I had a build, I had a similar orchestration here at letter D. Mm -hmm. Here at letter F later on, I'm using a similar orchestrational technique. And of course, we all know that our ears get tired. Mm -hmm. And our ears get very tired of hearing a similar effect. So to me, in terms of the percussion sheet, when I'm looking at continuity and flow and pacing, I'm thinking about rhythmic motifs. I'm thinking about themes that come back. But if you're creative enough, it might be in a vibraphone two voice. And then, did I just hear that extrapolated in a melodic bass drum? That was brilliant. I heard that in the bass drums. But it wasn't beating myself over the head. I was hearing it tastefully throughout the flow of the wind book. So to me, the continuity and flow of pacing in one hand works in concert with the wind book, but also you have choices in terms of what am I doing to represent a creative percussive journey along the, the flow of the wind book. And finally, the last bullet point here, effective use of electronics when present. This could be its own webinar in and of itself, as you know very well, Jerry. Uh, the electronics to me are this incredible voice that can A, of course, stand alone. Of course, it is its own color, its own texture. But then the trap that many, many ensembles fall in at every level, I might add, is assuming that that color that voice, that texture needs to be heard irrespective of what's happening around it. So I like to use the, the analogy of feeling warm. So if I'm listening to the winds very, very carefully at letter M in the third production, and I hear the low brass play and then the woodwinds come in and color it, I have a very clear picture of what that is meant to sound like. And if I want to enhance that moment, I might choose an electronics moment that warms up the moment that I cannot pick out what which voice is in there. Mm. I just know that the marching band has this beautiful warmth to it that doesn't have it when the electronics are playing. Then, of course, you have opportunities where the electronics are an effect, and it's incredible. It could be narration. It could be a sound effect. It could be a voice. It could be an, an instrumental effect. But 
anything between those two extremes, and of course not using it, tacit, any one of those three opportunities, I think always needs to be seen on a horizontal journey sheet. If I'm looking again from moment one to minute eight, I want to look at a map of my electronics. And if I see that, you know, electronics really haven't, haven't really been a part of this, but oh, they're kind of introduced here, but it's not overt, it's very subtle. And it really helps the trombones do X or Y, and then it's out. And there's this beautiful woodwind color, we don't need them. And then here, there's an incredible effect or sound effect that the electronics are providing here, and they go away. And then there's an impact, and it's a, an organ swell, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So those are the kind of the high level things in each of those percussion content bullet areas. And I apologize for going through them so quickly, but those are the main highlights. And each one of those, we could continue to talk for an hour on each. But those are some high level concepts that I think everyone needs to be aware of. Absolutely. And, and I like, and we could talk about this when we talk from a teacher's perspective, but when we begin thinking about source material and our ability to manipulate source material, I think sometimes sure. we get beholden to the idea of this is the way the composer originally wrote it. I've got to stay true to right. it. And I think, as you said, we're, we're in a different genre already, right. guys. Yes, it's okay to right. strip away some things. Yes, sir. Do you... Do you, so it's easy. <laughs> Flash to a snare line. Exactly, exactly. Go ahead, you want to finish your point? Oh, yeah, that? sure. So I, I loved your question, Jerry, which is coming back to clarity of what are we trying to achieve. So if I'm there in the stadium and I'm listening to Group X, I really want to say to myself, I love that they're really trying to bring Bach to the stadium. Mm -hmm. Or conversely, I want to be able to sit there on the 35-yard line and say, I can't believe that they used that Pasacalia and they took the Beastie Boys. How did, I would have, that's incredible. How did they, and the seamlessness of, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. That's the question that you want to ask yourself before it gets up to Joe Hot Dog. Right, right, yeah, absolutely. So on the second question, as we switch over to the right side of the sheet mm -hmm. and the, from over to achievement, mm -hmm. we transition from talking about what's being asked of the performers to how they're maximizing that. So um, let's talk battery percussion first. So we see descriptors like quality and tuning, precision and timing, technique, blend, balance, transparency. Mm -hmm. um, what are you looking to assess when you listen to the battery? And remember, at the state level, this percussion judge can be on the field. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So... I think that there's a world of opportunity in each one of these, but one of the things that I think is very, very important for directors to understand that uh, a very, very educated judge will not assume, and we need to be really held accountable on the adjudicator side, is to not assume that quality is universal. Mm. There is characteristic sound, and that is universal. There is resonance, there is control, there is expression. But quality, in my mind, and how I like to explain this when I'm chatting with folks in different uh, situations, is that quality really is a function of the genre of music and what you're trying to say. So I like to use, and I'll just nerd out for a moment here with all my percussion friends, if I'm going to play a role and I really dig in and I want every 30 second note to be very, very strong, that might be incredibly important when I hit an impact and the band is playing Bartok. That same really machine gun type sound may not be appropriate if I'm playing a lyrical counter phrase in mm -hmm. Debussy. So quality would not necessarily match there. Now, the rhythmic consistency of those two examples, of course, that's mm -hmm. universal. But quality, we need to be careful how we throw that around. Quality, and this is the most important thing I can share, has to do with making characteristic sounds that are come from a very mature aspect. So if they are really, really after supporting the most sincere part of that musical moment and they're making great sounds, that is quality. Mm -hmm. That is quality. Quality does not come from my school of where I went to this drum corps, my school of music that I graduated from, because that tends to be a little bit of a, a delineation in, in our world. So I just want to make sure that everyone knows that in the truest sense, quality has to do with the characteristic sound that is extrapolated from the right musical moment. So that being said, tuning, 
that really goes hand in hand with characteristic sounds. Obviously, you want the the drum uh, or the or the, the, the membranophone, if you will, to always have as much resonance or as much articulation is a pro that is appropriate for that musical moment. So again, they work hand in hand. A lot of it is just being uh, on top of how much diligence you need to put into the quads, for instance. I, I'm, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say that it's, it's very common for a lot of marching bands not to put in the time to make sure that all those drums are in tune with themselves. It does take time. It does take time, but not unlike I need to tune my high woodwinds before every contest. It is no different. Without proper intonation, it just students will sound less mature, and that's that's not the part that's not the fault of the student. So we need to take the time to really do that for the bass drums, the quads, and of course the snare drums. Uh, precision and timing, uh, we could go through all these. I hope I I, I don't uh, belabor these points, but uh, precision and timing, uh, we're going to talk about that's a universal quality there in the front ensemble as well. That is literally just what it sounds like, and making sure that how they are being asked to to play a two D rhythm that perhaps lines up with another part of the percussion section or the winds, and just evaluating are they doing that together? Right, it's just excellence. Uh, technique. This is, a, this is a really, really hot, hot topic here, very much like quality. And it's very important that we take a look at the end goal of technique and not how they are physiologically getting the sound to come out of the drum. Now, case in point, I am an, a, an adjudicator and I'm watching a group. In the back of my mind, I teach my own groups or I've taught my own groups for many years, maybe very, very successfully. And I look at this marching band and I say to myself, that's not how I would have had the students play their instrument. In a really, really highly held accountable adjudicator, they will say, that is not my call. The technique has to do with creating the appropriate sounds. Mm -hmm. And that's something I just want to continue to say everywhere I go. Technique is only a function of achieving the best characteristic sound. That's why all of these work hand in glove from a really, really big picture adjudicator. So technique, as long as they are consistent by which they are getting the correct sound, and we're going to come to balance and blend, so on and so forth, that's how you evaluate technique. Again, just to put a really fine point on this, not to say that is not the technique that I taught in my career, therefore technique is poor. That is absolutely mm. incorrect. And I want all the directors to know that a really excellent adjudicator does not think that way, and I want you to be completely confident to teach whatever technique is going to serve the musical moment and more importantly creates that incredible characteristic sound. Mm -hmm. Blend balance and transparency. I like to to use these bullet points from the context of the Chrono String Quartet mm -hmm. or the Dallas Wind Symphony. It could be any musical ensemble in the world and if you're listening on that level of true match and inflection and then you have that in your mind and your ear and then you look at this subsection of the marching band drum line then of course you can you can apply the same principles so blend balance and transparency transparency starts to speak to something else but in terms of blend and balance in particular are we creating the right sounds from the right intensity level and here's something that a lot of people don't understand. The smaller the, the number of students in a section, the more difficult that is mm -hmm. to, to really uh, adjudicate and also to teach. So when you have a nine-man snare line, there's some things you can kind of get away with. But there are three. You can hear those students, especially like you mentioned, if the percussion judge is out in the field, you can definitely hear at the top of a roll, this player tends to, to accent a little bit more, so on and so forth. So that blend throughout every phrase and the balance from performer to performer is tremendously important. Uh, phrasing and artistic expression. This is just taking the written page and are the students making it their own? Are they reading what's been given to, the, given to them and are they playing it relatively well but it doesn't move you or are they taking control of where are the small and the longer phrases going? So a lot of these small bullet points 
tend to work off of the, the content. Mm -hmm. Well, my instructor didn't give me a long phrase. So that's why this has to be a hand in glove achievement. That's why it's on the same sheet, right? But at the same time, if I've given you X, are you as the student, are you turning it into Y? Mm -hmm. Does it have a sincere amount of shape? So that's, that's what that's all about. And then dynamic contrast, again, similar to that. You just have to dial into the fact that at the end of the day, it has to be worth listening to. Mm -hmm. But the arranger didn't, we don't know, we don't care, and we can't see it in the stands. Mm -hmm. Does it move us at the end of the day? If I'm listening to this high school band's clarinet section in this part of the show, I want to be moved. I want to notice that there's care and intonation and quality of sound, just like this phrase of the quads in this band's opener. Mm -hmm. It is no different. It has to have some sort of musical shape, and it has to be full of characteristic sound. Absolutely. Mark, you want to pause and restart the camera for a second just so we keep it, and I'll go to this next one. Universal answer, and it is the exact same lens. Mm -hmm. A musician on the field is a musician on the field is a musician on the field. Now, they're playing a different instrument, but I would hope to hold a French horn player and a vibraphone player and a snare drum player and a trumpet player the exact way in terms of my standard. So we have the same quality tuning. There are less tuning examples in the mm -hmm. front ensemble, but there are membranes. We have concert toms, we have concert snare drums. Um, then of course, as the weather affects us, we definitely <laughs> have our challenges with uh, 440 versus mm -hmm. 444, etc. cetera. Uh, but in terms of quality, are we making the same characteristic sounds player to player. Mm -hmm. So you might have an incredibly talented person on vibraphone, xylophone, marimba, and great, they're making X sound, wonderful. And then you watch the next person that is standing next to them playing a 2D part, and they're playing with a different touch and a different mm -hmm. inflection altogether. Well, that speaks to the quality, and it also comes down to a, a blending perspective as well. So. Quality has to be recognized when students are being asked to play something in a 2D fashion. That's really the lens by which you can say, we are not inflecting the same way. So we could go through all of these things, but just to keep it very simple, Jerry, you're exactly right. The same lens uh, is applied. When I'm looking at the front ensemble, are they trying to inflect the phrase the same way player to player? Are they trying to make complete shapes? or are they playing the notes they've been given? Mm. And so that's a very, very general starting point, but it's the same lens. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things... Oh, that's a great question. First of all, I'm, I'm incredibly thankful that that's there. So individual to individual is exactly what we just talked about. The, the obvious comparison between those two students playing a similar part. Mm. When you get into the section cohesiveness, the first thing you can you can think of is, well, these two sections are asked to play a similar rhythm or even the exact same part, and it doesn't line up from an intensity standpoint, a phrasing standpoint, and sometimes we have the opportunity to look at those two sections and they are staged very part, far apart. So either horizontally or front or back field. And so when they do line up, then we have the opportunity to say directors, and students, incredible job. I know what it went in, I know what went into making that happen. That is a lot of experimentation and hard work to dial in all of those variables. And so having that on the sheet is an amazing opportunity to reward those students and directors that put in the time to really figure out from an ensemble perspective how those sounds are not only A, matching, mm -hmm. if you're standing still, and then out on the field, are they reaching the audience at the same time? And lastly, are they saying the same thing musically? Mm -hmm. Are they really impacting us the same way? That's awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how does it help them know kind of where the score should land, but also where their opportunities for growth might be? Oh, great question, Jerry. I think this speaks to the maturity of the group. Mm -hmm. So I might be listening to an ensemble with some amazingly talented students, and they might have two, three, four opportunities in the show where what they're playing is just inspirational. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. The other 90, 91, 92% of the show the rest of the section is struggling. It doesn't take away from how talented those students that are really achieving a high level of competency is. It doesn't take away from that at all. However, a really articulate adjudicator will mention throughout 
the performance that that was outstanding, great job, and recognizing all the incredible things that are happening in that moment, but then also commenting gently that this still needs some massaging. Mm -hmm. You might want to take a look at this. Oh, some troubles here, and so on and so forth. And so by putting these descriptors, the sometimes, all the rarely to always, that is an incredibly helpful device to speak to the maturity of the group. So if you have this high level marching band, drum corps, what have you, and you hear them finals week and they're a very accomplished ensemble, most of the time they're going to be in the always category. They're older, they're more experienced, they're very consistent at producing excellence. Mm. Whereas we in the high school marching band, as we are teaching, we are really rewarding ourselves how to build on this is the opener, these are the notes, and we are building the, the credit from this is me knowing, now I'm understanding, and, I, and I'm experiencing, and now I'm starting to be more consistent, and I build my way up to always. So by recognizing that journey in the eight minutes, wherever we are in the season, early, middle, or the end of the season, hopefully the adjudicator will give some feedback in terms of you are accomplishing X or Y or Z, but at this frequency level. Mm -hmm. And again, that comes back to maturity of the group. Yeah, and it, it's about judging the whole show. Kind of to get back to that level is about seeing them from beginning to end. So it's not just that isolated percussion feature that got you the always designation, but yes, it's, the, it's judging it through time. Judging through time, yeah. the best way to say it. Yes, sir. Awesome. So let's talk now. It's an, an amazing question. And I really try my best to balance the credit and the success from a purely numerical standpoint with what I feel is way more important, and that is the actual curriculum of the kids. Mm -hmm. These kids are living with every note that I craft for months at a time, and they are working really hard. And that does never that is never lost on me, Jerry, mm -hmm. ever. And so I have something, and I, I, I'd be happy to share this with you if you like, but I call this my Oz de Moore Music Arranging Considerations. And so I have a list of ball points. This is literally pulled up on a separate monitor for every note that I write for every one of my clients. And so, and in no particular order, does the part enhance the wind book or the band aesthetic? It's got to serve the greater whole. That's number one. But right after that, I go into a lot of detail that talks about the student has to be enriched. So at the end of the day, I want this student from this school, after having played my arrangement, yes, hopefully it's successful and enhances the wind book and so on and so forth, and the band was successful as a result. But even more importantly to me personally, I want that student to be a more mature musician. Mm -hmm. They've now played a soft triplet by themselves. They had to balance a third with the, their counterpart in the vibraphone section. They've never played a fivelet, let alone a fivelet on the upbeat of three. They've never played this cymbal pattern that, and they had to listen back to the quads. They had a hocket conversation with the battery. So all of those things, and it goes into a lot of detail, but all of those things are most important to me. I want that student who is spending every minute and every hour of the fall on my curriculum. Yes, I want the band to be successful, but not at the expense of their musicianship. And I think we all know that the opportunity exists for marching band to be a competitive product. And so to your question, just to really bring it home, that is never going to be as important to me as the students needing to be stronger musicians and exposing them to musical concepts, vocabulary, both technically and rhythmically uh, at the end of the season. Yeah. yeah. No, and this, this never leaves me. This yeah. never leaves me, and I keep coming back to this for every question. And, and I think that's so important to, to go back up. To, I'm going to go up to something you said earlier about our first question with regard to variety as yes, sir. well. Yes, sir. Because when we're talking about curriculum, it, it would be like us teaching a, in an English class a set of literature, just the same book, three or four <laughs> different versions of the same. But, but what we want with our percussion students to grow that curriculum as well is to have some variety in yes, how sir. we approach things. Yes, sir. Um, I think that's so crucial as well. Absolutely. I think that's beautifully said. Beautifully said. So when we think about the achievement. Great question. The answer may surprise some people, and that is I always share with my students the overall goal for wanting that part to be clearer. So for instance, let's say you and I are working with an ensemble, and this part by this section, let's call it the snare line, has a really great feature, and it's just not, it's not done at a high level. 
So the first thing that a lot of younger uh, directors might do is go down and say, hey, snares, this hand speed needs to do this, and we're coming in early on, on the tay of three, and, and be careful, and they will immediately start talking about the physiological uh, ways to make this clearer and so on and so forth. While that's not wrong, I personally like to say, snares, just so you know, the entire band has cleared out this opportunity. You are now coming forth. Here's where we are in the production. And did you notice that that rhythm comes back here on beat four into beat one? And you might have two kids go, yeah, I did, didn't we play that in the open? That's right. So here's what's happening. I wrote that because that motive is going to be embellished here. So what we need to do is set up that motive on beat four and then one of the next bar, but no one will pay attention to that if what we're presenting to that motive that connects us to the opener mm. is not clear. And the more light bulbs you have for the students to really take ownership of, okay, now I understand. So this is a big moment for us. I thought we were just up front for some reason. No, you're up front because you are very important and if you if they know they're important and then you know if they know why this this needs to be very clear and maybe even tell them a little bit about the vocabulary that's gone into it and share with the students from the director's point of view why it's there why it needs to be clear then they have a greater context to go oh i see why the, the technicians and the band director are on my case about this being good. So I would start with that. Mm -hmm. Instead of jumping into the nuts and bolts, oh, the Tay of Three needs to such and such and don't be early. And while that's all true, start with not assuming they know what's going on. I personally am a big fan of treating the students as young adults that are capable of way more than we give them credit for. So I'd like to make them kind of honorary design partners. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean my, my last chair snare drummer is going to necessarily say, Mr. Osdemore, I changed that uh, role. Is, is that okay? That's a different conversation. <laughs> but at the same time, if they understand a little peek behind the curtain as to why we're trying to make this special for the audience, then they will have a great understanding of like, oh, I see why they want this to be really clear. Well, I, I love that you approach it. Again, it's such a teacher's approach to say, let's talk about the why yes. before we get to the how, because I think you're right. And I, and, and I think that as judges, we can be guilty of this as well. We can often delve right into the, the tick tape, you know, the old yes. school tie. And I mean, I certainly, <laughs> the percussion world is probably more guilty of this than any other area. Yep, yep. But you know, the, the old fashioned tick tape, and that's not what we're aiming to do um, as, a, as a judging community or as a teaching community. We want students to be out there uh, attempting to do their personal best, and, and we recognize that there may be times that they fall short, um, mm -hmm. but the fact that they understand why it's yes. in their curriculum. I love that, Jerry. We are absolutely in the business of building young people up. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it goes beyond music, but it starts with, I'm going to listen to this judge, and I felt like that was a good show. Let's hear what they say. And if they have the mindset that you just talked about way back in the day of a tick tape and they're tearing down, mm -hmm. they're finding things to nitpick, then at some point, then it's going to be almost along the lines of why am I doing this? I felt good and this, this expert is, is finding things wrong. I think the real beauty and the art of adjudication is saying something constructive while in the context of saying, that was incredible. I see you're backing up and the hand speed changed and not quite clear on the roll, keep your hand speed moving, so on and so forth. But wow, I can't believe you guys are that clear That's this early in the season, that's amazing. And saying something has room for improvement mm -hmm. through the lens of I'm building you up is more important in 2021 than it ever has been. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Um, any additional thoughts that you want to share about the 5A, 6A state percussion experience and sheets? I'll go a little bit off the, the beaten path for a second and just express my personal opinion that I am thrilled that the level of detail is being offered to our directors around the state, Jerry. Music education in the state of Texas is singular in its excellence. And for decades now, we have not had this voice and this platform to reward all the hardworking students in this choir of the band. So from a personal perspective, 
I am just thrilled and I'm, I'm very honored that you asked me to speak to you today. And professionally, I, I can't wait to see how this impacts some choices that are being made by percussion arrangers and percussion directors that we can actually really let our students stretch their legs within excellent taste. Awesome. Well, thank